Our speaker today in chapel is Dr. Kevin Wong. He's an assistant professor for theological studies. Prior to his coming to DTS, Dr. Wong taught both theology and philosophy at various institutions, including Biola University, Azusa Pacific University, and Moody Bible Institute. His research interests include Christology, theological anthropology, and theology proper, especially from an analytical theological perspective. He has a heart for students to live Christologically and holistically, body, mind, and soul. He and his wife, Sarah, have four children, Silas, Annie, Zeke, and Trinity. He loves to cook, drink, uh, coffee and tea, <laughs> exercise, play video games, and read from a wide variety of genres, from history to psychology to fantasy. He also has an insatiable sweet tooth. Would you please join me today in welcoming Dr. Kevin Wong to our pulpit. I do like to drink coffee and tea, so there we have it. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Um, not only do I have only 15 minutes, but I'm not much of a preacher. I'm actually much more of a lecturer. I like a small classroom environment with a whiteboard, especially a whiteboard. My students can attest to you that I do not like PowerPoint. Um, if I have to use a PowerPoint, I have to labor over it uh, for a long time. Uh, so, lect uh, lecturing is a different art than preaching, and I don't feel like I'm as good as a preacher. And I can't really see the audience too well. The lights are very bright. I can't see you all on YouTube either, but um, I'm pretty sure my homiletics uh, colleagues are cringing in their seats now. Why? Why would you undermine your own authority as the preacher right now by, by pointing out your shortcomings? Um, well, that's why I'm a theologian and not a preaching professor. <laughs> But don't worry, this will all become relevant in due time. Uh, my message today is uh, entitled, Work With What You've Got. And it's based in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. Um, so if you would turn there with me, please. I'm reading from an older NIV uh, translation because I'm old and stubborn. Uh, I don't like the updates. Um, not because I have anything like philosophically, theologically against them. I just don't want to buy another Bible. So <laughs> there you have it. So the parable of the talents. Again, this is Jesus speaking. It, that's the kingdom of heaven, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, that's five coins. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went and buried it. He dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of these servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who received the one talent came, maybe shuffling, head down, right? Um, and he said, uh, master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seeds. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. And throw, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So today, with the short amount of time that we have today, I want to point out three observations from the text. And these are three implications about our lives. 
Okay, this is not about investment. I know we're all worried about uh, supply chain crisis and uh, inflation and what have you. Let's not worry about the monetary values of our lives. Let's think about the talents of coins as representative of resources in our lives in general. Be it time, be it skill, be it abilities, whatever it is, good old fashioned elbow grease. So here's the three, here are the three implications of this text for us. It's gonna come in the format of be something positive and avoid being this negative thing. So the positive, the first positive is be loyal. And the negative is avoid being stressed. When you notice the three servants, you'll notice that servant number three, the one who was handed the one coin, he was stressed. This is a hard master. Oh my goodness, what am I to do? Right? And notice his lack of loyalty. He said, with this one coin, I'm going to enact my agenda. The master's taking his sweet time before coming back. I'm just going to take it easy, not labor. I'm just gonna bury it into the ground. He didn't even get any kind of return, not even a half coin back, because he did nothing with it, but just bury it. Contrast that to the other two servants. The two servants at once put the money into work. It's not that they invested the five or the two talents and then overnight it was a 100% return. It might have taken time, a long time, before they got anything back. And maybe they even lost a little bit before they were able to regain the master's return. And so today, when I say uh, invest your time, your resources, whatever they are, you might feel stressed. And I don't want you to feel stressed. This is not about works righteousness. We don't have to belay the point. We're here at DTS. We're a Protestant school. We capitalize on the idea of grace, that God saves you through sending his son by the power of the Holy Spirit. We hammer that into you all the time. And especially when you're in my classes, I'm going to hammer that over and over again. You do not save yourself. This is not about works righteousness. I'm not asking you to do more. You're doing a lot. You're here. You're in summer school, for goodness sakes. Of course you're doing more, right? Here's a typical DTS student story that I hear. I'm a full-time student. I'm a full-time employee. I'm a husband or wife. I've got kids. I volunteer at my church. I volunteer for this other ministry. Plus, my neighbor is sick, so I'm taking out his garbage and mowing his lawn. Right? I volunteer for the PTA. I make sure my kids are taken care of. And somewhere in there, you have to take your spouse out for a date on occasion. Hopefully, like, once a week, once a month, once a year. Okay? <laughs> right? After I get that thesis in, honey, right? After I get that dissertation in. You are busy. And with me preaching this, you might worry, ah, oh, this just is stressful, Dr. Wong. You're telling me to do more. The emphasis is not necessarily do more. Although some of you might need that. Some of you are just coasting along, and maybe you do need to do more. That's not the emphasis. It's not do more. The emphasis is do more for God. Be loyal. Okay? Faith is, of course, a trust in God. We all know this. But it's also allegiance. It's when you wake up in the morning and you say, God saves me and I don't need to work for my salvation, but I love him. I do for him. What is it that you have to do in the morning? It's easy for us to wake up and say, gosh, I got to exercise. I got to take out the trash. I got to drive little Johnny and little Susie to school. And we get caught up in our own agendas forgetting that we are entrusted these things and we do these things for God, for his sake. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, changing diapers, drinking coffee, talking with coworkers, whatever it is you do, you don't do it for the self, for the glorification of self, for the comfort of self. You do it because you love God. So the emphasis is not do more. Don't be stressed if you, if you hear me say that. Hear me say that I'm not saying that. Do more. It's do more for God. Whatever it is that you're already doing, do it for God. Because you're already doing a lot. But re remember, it's about allegiance. It's not necessarily about works, about doing things. The second observation and implication of our lives, here's the positive. Be responsible for what you have. And here's the negative. Avoid resentment for the things that you don't have. And this is a lesson that I'm trying to teach at my own house. Right, so I have three kids who are uh, of video game playing age. You know, Zeke is three. He doesn't really play video games. He just sort of mashes the buttons. 
But the way that they earn time for the Nintendo Switch is they need to do chores and they need to do schoolwork. It's summertime, so you know we've we've uh, relaxed our standards for for homeschooling. They don't have to do a lot. You know, got to keep up the math though. The math is the perishable skills. They read just fine. Right? They're they're going to pick up all their graphic novels and comic books anyways and read. I'm I'm not worried about that. Uh, but that's how they earn it. Well, Zeke, being three, he doesn't he doesn't know how to read. And so he doesn't have a lot of schooling. He doesn't have a lot of chores. What can a three-year-old do, do? And so he gets resentful. He looks and says, ah, why does my older brother, why does, why does my older sister, how come they have much more time on the Nintendo Switch? Right? And so we, we do that. We think, oh, it's, it's so cute when a three-year-old does it. But we don't recognize that we do that too. How often do you scroll on social media and you see somebody with a great vacation, right? Or you think to yourself, gosh, I'm laboring so hard and not getting the dream job that I want. And look at this other person, so much charisma. Look at the influence that they have. We do this easily. Servant number three's attitude towards his master is, hey, you've got it so easy. You get to boss us around. You get to collect all these dividends for things that you have not done. You haven't sown. You didn't invest, but you get to benefit. What's up with that? And notice servant number one and number two, they don't have that attitude. Maybe they felt it in their heart somewhere, but that's not what their actions did. Their actions said, we got to be responsible for this stuff that's not even mine. Just remember that. Your resources in your life, they don't belong to you. They belong to God. Remember, remember Colossians 1, 15 through 17, all of creation is made by the Son and for the Son. It is for His pleasure that you are here at DTS. Will you get accolades? Will you get prestige? Of course you will. DTS carries a fine reputation. Everywhere I go and I tell people where I work, they're like, that's amazing that you work at DTS. And I feel that pleasure, but I have to remind myself, it is not for my pleasure that I work here. It is for Christ's pleasure. It is at his whim that I'm here, not mine. And same with you. We don't all get the same resources. We don't all get the same luck, the same opportunities. And it's easy for us to then be angry that I'm not getting, I'm not getting. But what is that to you? That's one of the key themes of my life from John 21, 22. We always emphasize with John 21, with the resurrected Christ, calling Peter back into ministry. We emphasize that Jesus asks him three times, do you love me, do you love me? And all the Greek exegetes are like, oh, it, it, there's a difference in the Greek word, right? Is, is there an emphasis there? And that's fine. But what we skip often is the final exchange between the resurrected Christ and Peter. Because Peter's stressing out. And he says, ah, what about him? What about John the Apostle? You're ragging on me, Jesus. And what's Jesus' response in John 21, 22? He shrugs. And he says, what about him? If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So rather than looking at the guy with the five talents, the good-looking gal with the perfect dream job and the charisma and all the friends and influence, rather than saying, what about them? Jesus is saying, what about them? What if I want them to retain all this prestige and charisma? What is that to you? You must follow me. So be responsible for what you have, not resentful for what you don't. The final observation and implication for our lives, the positive is be vigilant, and the negative is avoid being complacent. Notice servant number three's laziness and being surprised by the master's return. The master took a long time, and then when he shows up, servant number three's like, oh man, okay. What servant, have, what servant number three might have thought doesn't matter. What's the point of investing one coin? But one coin can become two. And then when you have the two coins, you are like the servant with the two coins. And then the servant with the two coins, of course he didn't start off with five coins. He had two. But once he doubled it and became four, four is not a, that far away from five. Incremental change, daily devotion to God might not look like much. How you look today may not look that different from yesterday. Maybe you're just 1% holier yesterday, today than you were yesterday. But over time, those 1% building upon each other become something more. That's one of the reasons why I think Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 warns us, by this time, 
you ought to be teachers. By this time, it's not overnight. You here at DTS, you students, as you're studying, you enter into my first class, we're not gonna get a lot done, I'm just gonna admit it to you. I'm gonna read you the syllabus, I'm gonna show you really cute pictures of my kids, tell you what I like to do for hobbies, right? And you know, it's been already spoiled since I, you know, we uh, had an introduction for me today, so you're gonna get a deja vu for everybody signing up for my classes, okay? We don't get much done on the first day, but by the end of the semester, how much should you know? How much ought you to know? Think about how many days of a year we have, 365. And if you can improve yourself 1% a day, 1%, 365 days, that's 365%. I'm not a mathematician, so I hear, okay? I'm a, I'm a theologian, three, one, three, I don't know, both, okay? <laughs> this applies to rest too. Again, with my first point, many of you might feel stressed. Oh no, Wong is telling me to do more, do more. This also applies to rest. Look, I'm a dad, full-time professor. I don't have a lot of opportunities to rest, but it does, but this pertains to rest as well, because guess what? When I put all the kids to bed, it's 9.30 at night, maybe I should be in bed by 10. I feel this inclination inside me to be amused. Maybe it's time for me to binge Netflix. Everyone's been telling me about Stranger Things or whatever, right? Whatever you crazy kids watch these days. And I think 9.30, uh, I could watch one episode, then one becomes two, two becomes five, and then I'm investing the wrong way, right? And I'm binging. And instead, maybe I can say, well, I don't have that much time to rest, but I need to take what I have and maximize it and just go to sleep. Rather than be amused, rather than scroll through social media and all the grossness that's there at 10 o'clock at night, maybe I just need to read a fiction book, turn my mind off from my professional work and just lay down and shut my eyes. Right? Rather than trying to squeeze in every moment of your day to to entertainment, maybe you should truly rest and put that phone away and spend time with the people around you. And, I, and, I, and again, I'm guilty of this too as, a, as an academic person. I'm trying to keep my Saturdays and Sundays free in order to invest in my family. And on Mondays, I wonder, why am I so tired? Well, maybe I'm tired because I'm sneaking away from my family to check on my work emails on Saturdays and Sundays. Okay. Oh, it's no emergencies. Well, that's kind of an emergency. The printer's out of, out of ink. That's not something I need to worry about on Saturday and Sundays. Maybe I just need to rest and invest what little time I have and turn it into something more. So here's a conclusion for us. Right? With all these three points, be loyal, not stressed. Be responsible for what you have, not be resentful for what you don't. Be vigilant, not complacent. And the conclusion is I started this message off by admitting my limitations, both skill and time. And I should conclude this message by noting that I'm responsible for what I have. I could complain. I could compare myself to others and say, I'm not a George Hillman. Right? I'm not as dynamic of a speaker as he is. I could say that. I could make excuses. And I can say, ah, 15 minutes is not a lot of time. Why don't you guys give me more time for like a chapel message time during, during the regular school year. I could say that. Or I can practice my skill and use what little time I have to inspire you to think about this week. So think about this week. What do you have? Work with what you've got. Thank you.